I'm going to be talking about um, the British Athletic Muscle Grading System on MRI versus ultrasound. And um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, the British Athletic System, um, I, I was invited to, to get involved with this with Noel and Rob, who you're going to hear from later. And um, I have to say, it was, uh, it was wonderful that they asked me because I've had more discussions about this than anything else in my entire career because it's so interesting. And I think the problem before the British Athletic System, that the, 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 the system was too simple, that was in common use, and other systems are out there which I think are too complicated. So I think the British Athletic System is just right, sort of. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we developed it, how the guys developed it, what our influence was uh, as radiologists. It was myself and Steve from the Midlands, and, uh, and it was a little collaborative effort, but mainly it was the two guys in front of me. It's a five-point grading system. I will be talking tomorrow about the differences between the UEFA uh, grading system and the BA system. Um, uh, so I'm not going to go into that now because I don't want to ruin the excitement. But um, it does go from a three-point to a five-point system, which is uh, in some ways desirable and others not. Um, essentially, it's a zero to four. Interestingly, the zero means MRI negative, and um, I have reported MRI negative scans. There is no abnormality on MRI, and then been called by the referrer to say which muscle has no injury in it, which, is, which muscle is the grade zero injury. So that was an interesting conversation. Um, but what we realized is that there's differences in uh, uh, muscle injuries uh, according to whereabouts within the muscle the injury is in reference to the muscle tendon junction. And that's what I think really has, uh, has caught on, and, and it's really interesting because I think it reflects everybody's practice when there's tendon involvement and what the degree of tendon involvement is, the whole thing changes. So we have a suffix now. So if it's an A, I remember A for away, because I'm quite simple. A for away from the tendon. And B is the muscle tendon junction, but C is intratendinous involvement. So once you get into C, the, the, rule, the, the, the outcome will change, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is, I'm going to take the images that we published uh, uh, in our paper. And um, you're, this is just a, an illustration. Feel free to grab it afterwards. Um, it's on the internet everywhere. And um, it just basically describes the different locations. So A, away, B, around the tendon, the MTJ, C with tendon involvement. Okay. So there is, uh, I mean, I have to say, uh, even though I helped devise this system, I still often have to refer to the table that's published as well, you know, because it, it can be confusing, and it is worth having it on your phone or any other such portable device and, uh, and refer to it. So essentially, for a grade one injury, the length of the edema has to be less than five centimeters. The cross-sectional area of muscle edema has to be less than 10% of the overall cross-sectional area of the muscle, and the tendon is normal, okay? So for a myofascial injury, and this is the image we used in the paper, and we'll maybe talk about this again later on, that the classic myofascial location when you read about muscle injuries is at the um, short head, long head, biceps interface. Now, I think we, Rob spoke earlier, which I wasn't there, uh, about this particular piece of anatomy, because I think that going back, I would not use this as an example, because I think this is actually a muscle tendon junction. But moving away from that, if it's away from the tendon and it involves between 10 and 50 percent, you're looking at a grade two injury, but again with a, a, a normal tendon because it's an A. So 10, once you get into the MTJ, we're now, this is the distal medial intramuscular tendon of long head biceps, cross sectional area, less than 50%, more than 10%, with a normal tendon and edema around the tendon, you're looking at a grade 2B injury. Now, C is defined where you start to get, there are various uh, elements that will take you up each grade. And if you have one of those elements, then you go to the next grade. So if the, the uh, cranial caudal length of edema is um, between 5 and 15 centimeters, you're straight on to a 2. If the uh, tendon is abnormal, in other words, if you have abnormal signal or discrete disruption of the tendon less than 50% of the overall tendon cross-sectional area and less than 5 centimeters, it's a grade C injury. And there should not be loss of tension on a grade 2 uh, C injury. Once you get to grade 3 C, which is the key one that you need to make a diagnosis for, and you'll see why in a second, there is loss of tension within the tendon. There's more than 50% cross section area tendon involvement, and that tendon involvement is over 5 centimeters. And there are other muscle criteria, more than 50 
uh, 15 centimeters, more than 50% of cross-section error. And then there's grade four, which is always a bit of a, a difficult thing to say on a report. I don't know why. You just never want somebody to have a grade four injury because we've had grade three for so long. Can you imagine you've now got a grade four? It's just terrible, it's like the end of the world. So essentially, you've completely ruptured, separated muscle tendon junction, and there's retraction. And the key thing, and this is a subsequent paper that Noel produced um, after the first paper, is to look for uh, the, the C grade injury. So C is the key, but actually I think I should change to three C is the key. So essentially, once you start to get a C injury, your uh, uh, return to play time, you can see this is time to return to full training on the left, uh, on the um, y axis, x axis is the injury classification. And you can see that once you get to 3C, you are having a massive difference. I did present once in France this paper, and the guy said, You know, you should not have any grade, just grade, uh, grade zero, uh, so grade 3C and everything else. It's kind of interesting comment because it makes such a difference once you, once you get a grade 3C injury because this is the re injury rate. So, really, the, 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 the key is the 3C diagnosis. So, I'm going to now talk a little bit about ultrasound, even though I'm going to show this on an, on an MRI. This is a rugby player, distal long head biceps injury uh, with sudden sharp pain, lateral thighs. So as we just run down, you can see on the, where's the thing? I slightly worry about these. It always looks like I've got Parkinson's disease. But anyway, there you go. This is uh, fluid on the surface of the muscle here. And it looks like a fairly innocuous injury, to be honest. But these ones are not, because what you're dealing with is you're actually dealing with some disruption of that tendon. And if you look at that axial image there, you can tell, if you were to zoom that up, and sorry that I can't, is that that's more than 50% of cross-section error. So actually what would traditionally look like quite a low-grade injury, because the edema is not that extensive, is actually quite a high-grade injury. And I think your experience and our experience will reflect that that is a potentially a bit of a disastrous injury if treated as a grade one. So the gradient system, as I said, 3C is the key, and that's the definition. Is there an intracellular tear, more than five centimeters, more than 50%, and you're allowed loss of tension, but no complete discontinuity? So could we use ultrasound alone? Well, as I said earlier, the UEFA system was a grade, uh, a grade we actually used grade one, two, three. We didn't have grade zero, but the original work by Petrons in 2002 was an ultrasound system. And these are his criteria, so essentially normal, uh, small areas, less than 5%, partial, complete, okay? So, you know, you could use ultrasound for that. That's how it's diagnosed. Could you use ultrasound for the BA system? Well, the pro there are a couple of problems. One of them is that muscle edema is quite hard to see on ultrasound. And what I mean by that is there's so much, I don't know how many of you do ultrasound, but I suspect a lot of the people in this room are doing ultrasound, that the anisotropy effect, you can make a muscle bright and dark however you want. You know, and if you want to cheat, to the player, oh, it looks fine. You know, just angle it. Um, so, you know, actually up to 50% of grade one injuries on ultrasound normal, particularly in the myofascial surface, right? Um, does that matter? Well, that's a separate issue because, you, as I said to the, the Frenchman, you know, 3C and everything else. Percent cross section area, it actually can be visualized very nicely on ultrasound most of the time, but there is a caveat to that, and this is a paper from David, which was quite, David Conlon from quite a long time ago, but definitely holds true, that when you have a complete rupture of the, the tendon and it pulls away from the bone, it is very hard to make out the tendon ends when it's surrounded by a hematoma. You just, huge explosion has gone off, and that, 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 that limits the quality of the ulcer. So this is the same player, and this is the uh, abnormal tendon on ultrasound. Now, it is hard to say whether that is more than 50% or not, but you, you, I think the real advantage is that you are able to start following these injuries up. And that's where I think ultrasound has some advantage, mm. even though papers suggest otherwise. So this is a footballer. Uh, and he, he did the usual Tories quad striking the ball. And this is, uh, if you just look at the dates, this was just heading up to the FA Cup final, uh, which he scored in. Um, and, Anyway, if you look at C1 in 2014 FA Cup, you'll know I was a very happy man. Uh, so this was him, and this is him, a typical strike the ball, tear your rec fam. And we could use this ultrasound as it goes through. For a week later, he's already beginning to get better. And as we come to this last scan, he's a month down the line from the injury. He's got no fluid. The tenor's looking quite nice. And he went on and, and scored the winning goal. So can you use ultrasound? Well, you can't reliably assess edema. But you, I mean, you can't reliably assess loss of tension. 
because you're scanning typically in an axial plane. And if you do a sagittal plane, it's hard to actually you know, achieve that. So um, what you can do is you can look at percent cross-sectional uh, cross area, particularly in the hamstring tendons away from the tendon, uh, bony attachments. You can look at how long that tendon involvement is by literally drawing on their skin surface. And, but you may not be able to identify the uh, complex tendon, the tendon ends if it's uh, surrounded by hematoma. But it has advantages for hematoma resolution, serum resolution, and what's happening with the uh, tendon. So, look, we have to be realistic. The BA system was designed for MRI. You can try and use ultrasound to mimic it, but you have to know that it's not verified in ultrasound. It's verified on MRI. The 3C is the key, and if that is the key, then we should be able to make that diagnosis. Now, I'm going to put one but in, because, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, because I'm, I'm now over time. But essentially, a paper came out, I got emailed twice in the last week, to say, oh, there's a paper. Anyway, a paper's come out suggesting that 3C is not the key, uh, and uh, uh, I would argue that it is the key. It doesn't include some key tendon injuries. I've seen the paper, so I'd like you to look at that and then chuck it in the bin. Thank you very much. So I, I'm going to be talking on injections for acute and chronic muscle injury, and I have uh, no conflicts of interest, I don't believe. It, this has been in, in, in scientific journals describing people who do injections, such as myself, uh, as quacks, voodoo specialists, snake oil salesmen, um, and I think to a certain extent that might be fair if you're looking at the evidence. There isn't really a lot of evidence for what uh, I'm talking about. There's a little bit, and there's some emerging, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not substantial. Uh, I'd, I'd argue that we're not necessarily answering, asking the right questions and evaluating the right outcomes. I don't necessarily know what they are, but uh, you know, we've got lots of interacting systems when you're recovering from a muscle injury, and actually does injection make a difference? Who knows? I think you've got to take some, some of uh, what you know from other research and you can apply it in the way that you think right um, for, for our uh, athletes. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my experience with British athletics and how we'd approach uh, muscle injuries in terms of injections. So what holds the athlete back during re rehabilitation? So a lot of people think it's just tissue healing but it's also pain. Pain might hold people back. It might be neural pain, it might be peripheral pain, it might be uh, strength loss or inhibition, uh, intolerance to load, uh, or suboptimal movement patterns and biomechanics. And so what clinical reasoning lies behind doing the injections? So you know, most people in the bad press comes from where you're just considering it to look at regenerating tissue and trying to get <coughs> tissue to heal quicker. But it's not just about that. Maybe we're trying to do that, but actually it's also about inflammation control. It's about dealing with notiception, peripheral inhibition, central inhibition, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, uh, ligamentous instability, and musculoskeletal dysfunction. And so those are the rationale that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, the type of injectates are uh, platelet-rich plasma, active vegan. We don't do all of these. This is just a list of what you can inject. Um, corticosteroid, tromeal, lidocaine, pipivacaine, saline, hyaluronic acid, uh, dextrose, and P2G, which is a mixture of phenol and glycerol. Um, Platelet-rich plasma, you draw some venous blood and you spin it down and then you inject it uh, into the lesion. It's meant to have uh, both anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory um, uh, mode of action uh, that may lead to uh, increased muscle regeneration. Active Vegan, uh, it's very popular in Germany, uh, Muller-Wolfhart. We've used it also in, in British athletics for muscle injuries. And again, not a lot of evidence, but uh, purported to uh, yeah, improve uh, muscle regeneration uh, when, when injected into a lesion. Tromil, uh, I love Tromil. I've gone past corticosteroid because you know what that is. Tromil is a, a homeopathic uh, solution made up of a, a number of homeopathic compounds in small quantities and again, uh, very popular in the continent as an anti-inflammatory agent, a, a homeopathic anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, dextrose, that's a 20% dextrose solution used uh, to try and treat uh, ligaments and try and provoke an inflammatory reaction uh, that leads to um, uh, 
uh, healing and, and, um, and thickening of connective tissue. And similarly, phenol and glycerin, another uh, prolotherapy agent. So uh, what's the rationale? Let's go through the rationale. So regeneration. So uh, when you get your initial injury, you get your bleeding and the platelets, and then a whole host of cytokines and growth factors that lead down a, a cascade. So the theory behind PRP is that you'd inject, it, um, inject that into, into the lesion. So the two agents that you'd look at for regeneration would be PRP and maybe active vegan. And so those are injected directly into, into the lesion uh, under ultrasound if you've got it. Inflammation control, obviously when you have an injury you get that uh, degradation followed by a few days of inflammation, followed by repair and remodeling. And again, uh, although inflammation is really important in that process, there are you know, some thoughts that if that isn't controlled, then you can lead to uh, well, pain, but you can also lead to um, a uh, damage to normal tissue, so not just, not just the tissue that's been injured. And the agents that we could, could use for that, PRP, has some anti-inflammatory effects. Corticosteroid we can't use because uh, you, uh, you need a TUE for that and it wouldn't be granted. But uh, certainly in play, uh, NFL they might use it where they don't have, uh, not under the WADA guidelines. Uh, and Tormil, again, Tormil props up quite a lot uh, in this talk. Nociception, so by nociception, uh, you know, you might have pain from the site or you might have pain from adjacent tissue. So quite often when you get a, get a, a muscle tear, then you get muscle spasm in, in, that, in that particular muscle. Um, that will send an afferent barrage into that spinal um, complex that will send out efferent signals that might be disordered. So you might get muscle inhibition, uh, and you also um, might get uh, hyperactivity in you know, areas of trigger points. And so they can be dealt with with Tromil and local anesthetics. We'd use that a lot in, in this circumstance. And probably more so, we concentrate on this area than we would in the, the intralesion injections. Central inhibition. So when you look at this uh, runner and you look at his lumbar spine, uh, his lumbar spine is going into flexion, extension, side bending to the right, side bending to the left, rotation to the right, rotation to the left. And, um, and I think that, I'd call that spinal oscillations and you know, you've also got that ground contact that might be increasing that as well and if you use translational research where you put subject cats to repetitive movement and then you uh, examine their ligaments their spinal ligaments uh, you find that they are full of inflammatory uh, mediators so you can set up theoretically spinal inflammation in the in this situation if you if you then think about the spinal canal you've got your posterior longitudinal ligament ligamentum flavum you know the the, um, the facet joint capsule if that becomes inflamed, that's close to the dura. If that's inflamed, that can maybe um, affect the dorsal root ganglion. And again, um, and, and also can, can cause sort of neural, neural pain. So two things, one might cause neural pain, but also that may cause um, uh, inhibition of peripheral muscles. So here, this is where the good old caudal epidural uh, can be used. It can be used uh, in injury, when you're trying to rehab, when you've got someone who's restricted, maybe with a positive slump test and just can't get that range, or when you feel that, uh, that centrally there is some inhibition. And the agents that you're injecting are Kenalog, which is obviously anti-inflammatory, lidocaine, which might just break that feedback loop, and uh, saline, which might just wash away some of those inflammatory mediators. I find it really, really effective. And the other instance we use it is maybe someone who's not injured, but you think they're getting to that stage where they're going to get injured. You know, they're training and they're getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and actually can be very, very effective. Um, in that same situation, you know, where you've got those spinal oscillations, that when you when you examine those cat ligaments, they tend to stretch or become slightly lax and get creep, and um, and take a long time to get back to their their normal normal size. So that's two might set up two things. One is a sort of mechanical instability because you're not getting that same um, support for the lumbar spine through the ligaments because they're now lax. But also ligaments are full of uh, mechanoreceptors and nociceptors. And again, through that inhibition, you may get um, peripheral inhibition. And that might be associated with um, you know, strength deficits in your rehabilitation. 
So uh, to treat ligamentous instability, obviously we're not doing anything inside the canal, but you can use prolotherapy agents, dextrose or P2G. Tend to use them into the um, interspinous ligaments, facet joint capsules, iliolumbar ligaments, and maybe the top of the SIs. And that can be helpful at a latter stage of rehab or again as a prevention of recurrent muscle injuries. And I know some, um, some practitioners would use it as a prevention for their, for their players. And then uh, musculoskeletal dysfunction. You know, this may be you know, an inhibitor to someone getting back to, uh, to full training. They might not have full range in their hips. It's a really important part of sprinting. Might be you know, lack of dorsiflexion. They might have some instability of their superior tib fib joint that might be overloading uh, biceps femoris. Uh, and so you know, injections may help there. Tromil into those tight trigger points that we talked about before. Ostenil maybe into the joints. Again, as an adjunct to all, doing all the right things. It's not a treatment on its own. And maybe prolotherapy to the superior tib fib joint, which I find very useful in those recurrent um, uh, distal biceps. So in summary, uh, I've had really good experience of using injections for muscle injury in athletics. I use some more than others, and I actually love trauma. Uh, evidence base is sparse, but you've got to remember that we're not necessarily trying to uh, affect tissue healing directly. And it's, also, it's, it's important to know that there's clinical reasoning behind what we do. Thank you very much. Re-injuries uh, generally occur as a result of an issue within either diagnosis, uh, rehabilitation or the return to play uh, process. Uh, within British Athletics, the primary uh, doctor responsibility is around diagnosis and medical interventions. And so I'll spend most of the talk uh, speaking about diagnosis and interventions and then touch on rehabilitation uh, and the return to play process uh, towards the end. Uh, a point of, of terminology uh, to start, I think strain is a particularly unhelpful uh, word uh, to use to describe muscle injury. I've, t uh, I've put the context for this talk alongside this definition uh, to, 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 to provide a context for everything else that I'll, that I'll talk about. Uh, so firstly, to, to, to speak about the structural diagnosis uh, in the management of any, any injury, uh, I think this is, the, uh, this is a very important starting point although I appreciate that that's a, a matter of debate with uh, various syndromes popping up, but uh, I'd be very much of opinion that uh, we get a good structural diagnosis and then takes things from there. Uh, structural diagnosis uh, uh, come from a, a clinical history, a clinical examination, uh, uh, imaging tests, and, uh, uh, and in elite sport often uh, 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 imaging uh, uh, videos or uh, um, uh, technical expertise of a, a observed uh, injury. Um, these, uh, before I kind of talk muscle injury in, in a bit more detail, I did want to highlight some clinical uh, diagnoses, and I usually see one or two of these a year that present with that uh, recurrent calf pain. Uh, firstly, uh, in the top left, uh, this is a longitudinal and an axial view of a, a partial plantaris rupture uh, that can present with recurrent uh, calf pain, usually can be managed uh, conservatively, and, uh, uh, and function is generally well maintained, but can present with recurrent injury with that tethering of the uh, the partial injury. Uh, obviously lumbar spine pathology can refer directly or sural nerve uh, can be implicated or, or directly be a cause of recurrent calf pain and that can be diagnosed through clinical uh, assessment. Uh, it's important in the athlete that presents with recurrent calf pain that we don't miss a popliteal ar uh, artery entrapment syndrome which can occur more often in sports people with uh, larger medial gastrox uh, affecting the popliteal artery behind the knee. Um, and, and we did have one case in British athletics of uh, an incompetent uh, uh, saphenous vein that presented with recurrent um, uh, uh, calf pain uh, that uh, caused some trouble for many months until we, we identified this as the source of the pain. Uh, and, and, and rarely, but, uh, but it can occur that uh, tibia, and particularly posterior tibia uh, uh, stress, uh, bone stress injuries can present with calf pain. So to move on to muscle injuries, um, as Justin presented, uh, we, um, uh, we published our British uh, Athletics Muscle Injury Classification. This does form the basis of um, our uh, uh, diagnostic process uh, in uh, identifying and diagnosing calf injuries. Uh, fascia, uh, muscle and tendon have different uh, healing uh, pathways and, uh, uh, and that's sort of formed the rationale for, uh, for, for, for putting this, uh, this classification together. Um, our clinical experience and published work, uh, to summarise, um, 
the A, myofascial injuries have got a very low re-injury risk uh, rate and can be pushed uh, very hard. And we're, <coughs> since our published work, we've, we've pushed these ones even harder with um, really quick return to play times uh, and very low uh, re-injury rates. And muscle tendon junction ones uh, follow a bit more of a traditional rehab course. Uh, and then, as Justin uh, mentioned, um, the intratendinous injuries can be associated with a high uh, re-injury rate uh, and uh, longer to return to play. Um, just last month, uh, the first study on the, uh, this classification uh, in calf injuries was published in uh, a small group of uh, 20 professional football uh, injuries over a three-year period, uh, demonstrating significant correlation with the grade and the return to play time. Uh, they, this, this was a retrospective study and they didn't have any re-injury data uh, as part of it. Um, but that, that was the first, um, first study that, that looked at our classification specifically in calf injuries. Um, but uh, Ramon Balius and, and Barcelona Group have published a, a classification with similar principles uh, as to ours, um, with uh, identifying anterior and posterior myofascial injuries of the soleus, um, uh, muscle tendon junction injuries um, at the proximal aponeurosis, and most importantly, central tendon injuries. And these are the ones that you need to identify early. These are the ones that are more prone to re injury. Uh, and take longer to uh, to return to play, uh, and significantly longer in this uh, in this study. I did want to make one point on uh, a, a separate a, a clinical clinical diagnosis or a, 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 a one particular uh, uh, diagnosis, and that is of the interface injury. Um, and anyone who uses ultrasound regularly in the manage of, management of calf injuries will uh, occasionally pick these up, where gastroc injury just. Uh, comes into that sort of fascial space between the gastroc and soleus, and you get a collection of fluid uh, within that space. Uh, there was a, a piece of work uh, published uh, just this year uh, looking at uh, soleus and gastroc and how they interact um, uh, when, they're, when they're both activated. And it's easy when on ultrasound assessment to think that there's a, a, a gliding between the fascia of gastroc and soleus, but actually under a, a, a active contraction, uh, there's very little aponeurosis displacement between those two, so the, the normal process is for the, that fascial, those interdigitations, fascial interdigitations, uh, to allow them to co-contract. So activation reduces aponeurotic sh uh, shear, which might have implications in how we treat that injury. So then, in addition to the structural diagnosis, uh, looking at the functional diagnosis, um, and there are technical aspects to that. So if we don't, if we look at the athlete on the right-hand side, striking with a a plantar flex foot uh, with the um, uh, muscle in slack and no pre-activation and increasing the load in the calf. If we don't, um, if we don't pick that up and identify that and, and make some technical changes, it doesn't really matter what we do in our rehab. Uh, uh, the, the answer could be, be, uh, be on the track and, and with the coaching cues and coaching eye. Uh, we also want to pick up neural contributions, uh, articular dysfunctions that may, may result in calf overload. Uh, and uh, muscular capacity in both calf, but also perineal and, and tip post, for example. So looking at, uh, at medical interventions, and as Rob said, you apply clinical reasoning to, uh, to, to choose interventions that can either uh, target the structural pathology or can target those contributing factors. Um, uh, they may include uh, treatments directed to the nerves, treatments directed to the, the ligaments of the uh, ankle uh, or the superior tip fib joint to increase stability. Uh, or to the, to the joint to improve mobility uh, and get the ankle or foot in a better place for the calf to take load uh, uh, and function. Um, and then just to comment on the interface uh, inject, uh, injury, I think you've got sort of a couple of schools of thought here either to leave it alone and do nothing about it, uh, to aspirate it or to aspirate it and inject something into it. Um, my preference is to uh, aspirate these and to eject dextrose into the, um, into the space between the, uh, the gastroc and soleus uh, on the basis that um, the, the co-contraction is assisted whenever they work together and they don't have that aponeurotic shear. So I would aspirate on several occasions and de inject dextrose into the interface for that type of injury. Uh, then some, just some points on, on, on rehabilitation. Uh, you must consider the functional demands to which the athlete uh, is uh, returning uh, uh, and target the, both the injured tissue and the injured uh, muscle. Um, leave
Niebuhr published a fantastic article on muscle architecture in 2011, um, which really reads as a, as a love letter to Soleus. Um, Soleus, uh, a muscle with very short uh, fiber length, so actin and myosin are, are completely uh, overlapped. Not in addition to its cross-sectional area, allows it or was defined as uh, the most important uh, uh, muscle on, uh, on stunts. Um, it's the, uh, the, the nature of its architecture allows it to um, uh, generate hu huge forces and we need to consider that in rehabilitation of, of soleus injuries. In addition, uh, if we consider uh, the stance phase when the muscle tendon unit is uh, undergoing stretch shortening, as shown on the top curve here, the, the <laughs> soleus muscle itself is undergoing isometric or concentric uh, contraction. The whole muscle itself, the muscle fascicles aren't lengthening, uh, which has implications for uh, rehab choice. You want to build in uh, fatigue resistance uh, in your soleus muscle so that it can hold this isometric or concentric um, uh, 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 contraction. Uh, slow uh, eccentric heel lowers are not going to do anything to prepare the muscle, uh, the soleus, to take four or five times body weight on, on running. Um, so rehab principles, load heavy, ensure you target rate of force development and build uh, fatigue resistance. Uh, rehabilitation should be uh, monitored uh, throughout, particularly in those recurrent uh, injuries, and that may be through very technical stuff with force plates and uh, garments, or maybe just simply recording a uh, number of block starts because the athlete with recurrent injury is at most risk of, of this, an imbalance in their acute chronic workload, making them more prone to uh, injury um, whenever they return. And then finally, uh, one slide uh, on return to play. We published our um, a, a, a th a thought on how we uh, approach uh, return to play, a shared decision-making decision model. Uh, our role as health professionals in, in, in British athletics is to provide information to the coach and athlete to allow them to make a, an informed decision. Uh, so the sort of things that we need to bring are, uh, is the central tendon involved? Is there an interface injury which increases the risk of recurrence? What's the capacity? What, what has been the rehab process as to how likely re-injury is to recur? And if that uh, risk is high, but it meets the sort of performance uh, requirements, that might may be a risk that, uh, that's worth taking. And I think that's, that's it. Thank you. A, a big thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to talk about the Delphi consensus study that we did on return to play after hamstring injuries. It was part of my PhD and uh, it's a fun story actually. Uh, I work at Go at Eagles uh, in Deventer, uh, which has a special link to the UK. Uh, we used to be Go, at Eagle, uh, Go Ahead. And then we got a Welsh coach, Barry Hughes, who said, no, we need the Eagles behind it. So, yeah, okay. Then we were go ahead, Eagles. Um, and uh, it's, it's a football club where I work with uh, on a regular basis. So I have no disclosure of interest here. Uh, so let's start off by talking about the hamstring muscle injury problem. Uh, why is it even a problem? It's a big problem because it's the number one muscle injury in, uh, in football and uh, with an increased match injury risk uh, when compared to training. Furthermore, uh, hamstring injuries are notorious for their high recurrence rates. Uh, about one third of the players that get injured will get injured again within a year uh, at the same site of their original injury. And this, uh, this was also shown uh, this morning, uh, has led to a decreased performance. Uh, playing with your uh, fit team and the whole team more will provide you with more points uh, than uh, with an injured team. And there has been, for the last 13 years, an upward trend for hamstring injuries uh, in, uh, in football. But the important part, especially for return to play, is that of those recurrences, about 50% of all recurrences occur within one month after return to play. An important message. And uh, this has been said to be due to either inadequate rehabilitation or premature return to play. And that's what we wanted to investigate, so the, uh, the return to play concept, how do we come to that decision, and which criteria should guide us, for instance. Um, we did the Delphi procedure because there is some evidence uh, saying, uh, especially on MRIs, uh, and the correlation with uh, return to play readiness, uh, but there's really no evidence that supports the decision itself. So we turn to the experts, um, and I'm sorry the slides are off a little bit, but we had three topics. The first topic was some general questions uh, on the Delphi procedure itself. For instance, how did we 
uh, agree on consensus, the terminology, the responsibilities. And we also wanted to have a critical look on the return to play definition because I saw a slide of the first speaker uh, in this session uh, who interpreted return to play as the moment players were back in full training again. But some studies have interpreted it as the moment a player has, uh, is pain free again or the player plays matches again. And for research purposes, it's always important that we talk about the same thing. So the definition part was an important part, and of course, the medical criteria that should guide the, the return to play decision after hamstring injuries. For this purpose, we uh, made use of the FIFA Medical Centers of Excellence Network. Uh, some of the 40 clinics were involved here as well. Uh, it's a broad network worldwide, and they delivered experts uh, with clinical, both clinical and research experience in the field of hamstring injury management. Uh, you can see some of the top guns on stage uh, today, so I can say we have a, a fantastic expert panel uh, in the end. Um, timeline, not so important. It took us about two, year to, uh, two years to, uh, to round up this whole Delphi procedure. And the results were published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine already, so it's, uh, you can read it right there. But on the right, you can see the return to play model for hamstring injuries in football. And there are some important aspects, both for research purposes and for uh, decision making. Um, we stick with the definition of return to play as being the moment the player has received criteria-based clearance and is mentally ready for full availability for match play and full training. So uh, that was the definition we used and of course, and we've heard this uh, moreover and I will get back to this on the last sheet, it's also important to make it a multidisciplinary decision and why that is, uh, I will tell on the last sheet. But this is maybe the important, most important slide for uh, the clinical decision making when we are faced with this decision, which can be a tough decision in, uh, uh, in sports medicine. Um, the experts stated criteria that uh, were included to support the, the uh, return to play decision after hamstring injuries and with return to play criteria that should be excluded. Neuromuscular function is excluded because it's really hard to quantify, but of course we all acknowledge that there's a role for neuromuscular function as an important aspect in uh, return to play decision making. There's also, uh, the experts also stated that MRIs should not be used uh, to guide the return to play decision making. And there's uh, already tons of evidence there that uh, MRIs and ultrasounds will not tell us anything about return to play readiness for the player. The experts also stated, and, and it was uh, maybe somewhat surprising that uh, eccentric strength measurements, strength measurements as a whole, should not guide the return to play decision making. And we put it in orange because the, our expert panel could not uh, agree on this topic. One part of the expert panel said, yeah, it's important because if we consider the etiology of the hamstring injury, the eccentric phase is the phase where it happens, and it's important to restore eccentric strength before you clear an athlete to play. But there's also another opinion, uh, which was the other half of the expert panel, that said, no, um, uh, strength measurements are really hard to measure in a reliable way. Uh, strength measurements are not functional, and uh, there are also some studies that have shown that players can return to play in spite of isokinetic deficits. So um, maybe a little bit Dutch, but we agreed to disagree and put, uh, put it in orange. And what should guide the return to play decision were uh, absence of pain, of course, on palpation during strength and flexibility testing and functional testing. Similar hamstring flexibility was deemed important. Uh, psycholo uh, psychological readiness, uh, of course, if the player doesn't feel ready, yeah, it's not going to work. Um, and performance on field testing. This is maybe the most important aspect. Uh, in professional football clubs, we have the GPS data. We can monitor speed uh, data, uh, distances, and uh, stuff like that, and compare it to pre-injury data and see how fit the player is. But if that's not available, repeated sprintability tests or acceleration, deceleration drills uh, could be used to support the return to play decision. We've seen this uh, uh, framework uh, this morning as well. Uh, step three was <laughs> eliminated a little bit from the slide, so I'll get back to it. But our model was intended to support step one and step two of, this, of the return to play decision making. So to judge tissue health and to uh, judge tissue stresses, I think that's the part where we as, medical, uh, as a medical team uh, that's where uh, we are, what we are good at. But there are also, of course, some risk tolerance modifiers. For instance, if uh, the player is up for a Champions League match, the decision on whether he should play or not might be different for when he's up to uh, a friendly match. So there are some decision uh, modifiers, and that should always be weighed. And that's also why it's important to make a multidisciplinary decision. 
because the athlete has something to say about risk tolerance modifiers, the coach has something to say. It's always important to make it a multidisciplinary decision and then come to the decision about the importance of returning to play versus the risk of re-injury uh, on the other hand. So summarized, uh, imagery has no value for return to play after hamstring injury. Clinical or especially field tests should guide the return to play decision. And it's not solely a medical decision, but should always be a multidisciplinary decision. Thank you for your time. This was the, the topic that was assigned. Um, the way I'm going to sort of frame it is in terms of, of risk management and return to play, so it should follow on quite nicely from some of the presentations we've seen before. Uh, again, I have no uh, disclosures to, to make. Um, so some of the things that we will explore are some of the concepts now that are around injury prevention in particular. There's been a lot written about, especially in the last 12 months, about current theories of uh, injury prevention. And it's very much theory at the moment. We're sort of going, going backwards a little bit, but look, talking about, a little bit about reductionist versus complex systems in injury causality, risk management considerations within injury prevention, and on the rehab side is, you know, when is it safe to return to play and building on some of the things that, that Nick just talked about. Nick pointed out again a little bit, we don't seem to be getting any better. And a lot of you have seen this, these comments earlier in the week, um, talking about players at professional football clubs having access to everything known to man in terms of recovery and resources and staff. However, coaches and managers have been wondering, is it all smoke and mirrors? Uh, this is uh, from Arsene Wenger saying, end of the day, since I've been in the job, we've improved a lot in the medical treatment, a lot, but still if you have a muscle problem, it takes 21 days. It took 21 days 30 years ago. If you have a look at Justin's first slide in everything apart from the C's, and you look at the average of that, it was pretty much 21 days, so um, it doesn't seem to be getting a lot better in those, and that, that sort of correlates with what, what Justin showed. Again, Nick presented this one here and saying that in the long-term UEFA study, 4% uh, increase annually in, in, uh, in muscle injuries. Um, and uh, so, you know, despite all the work that's being done, we may not be getting too much worse, but we're certainly not getting much better in preventing these. There's very little research in, in terms of, of muscle injuries, which are, you know, arguably with ACLs, probably the, the most costly injury in world sports, especially hamstrings. Um, most of the research has had a fairly reductionist view, looking at single risk factors versus injury occurrence. Um, and one that's probably had uh, one of the most emphasis recently is workload. Um, and you know, being able to say that their workload patterns are associated with injury. Nothing uh, further than that in terms of prevention and managing workload injury, workload and how that might reduce injury. That, we haven't got to that yet. And there's a number of different ways of quantifying workload. And this paper in particular shows four or five different methods for, for work, calculating workload metrics. So we don't even know that. We're a long way from putting that into prevention. Um, a live example, some of you may uh, follow um, uh, Dutch colleague of, of Nick's, um, always entertaining on Twitter, um, predicting that with a change in manager that Liverpool was going to have a spate of injuries based on the fact that this manager has a different uh, style where there's a lot more high speed running involved in the, in the type of play that they have and saying that you know, Liverpool's going to have a, a heap of injuries changing to Klopp. These were the stats that came on Sky saying the number of high speed metres that Liverpool were now were doing. And then, uh, luckily for Raymond, there was you know, six or seven hamstring injuries around that period, two or three months after that manager came into play. May or well be co coincidence, but it fitted his bias quite nicely. Another one that, in, apart from workload, that's been studied in a reductionist way is strength. So um, isokinetic strength, a number of studies over the years, conflicting results, but showing you know, isokinetic testing having a, a relationship between hamstring injury and hamstring recurrence. Um, there's a typical uh, curve that you might see. The left one there that was recurrent injury, this was in a track and field athlete, you know, had a 10% deficit across their range of motion in hamstring strength. Why wouldn't you start there potentially and try and normalise that? Other tools and bits of kit that can help with that. Ice kinetic machine maybe cost 100, 150 grand. Nord board in the tens of grand, tens of thousands maybe. Uh, that might quantify eccentric hamstring strength maybe. Um, or a simple field test that Nick talked about. Maybe uh, this one was published by Freckleton, the single leg bridge and AFL athletes, large group of AFL athletes who could do more than 25 of these were less likely to get a hamstring injury than those who could do less than 25, and that cost you nothing really. So that's the reductionist approach. What we've seen more recently is looking at, well, can we look at more complex systems? Because it's pretty unlikely that one particular risk factor is going to be the, the reason why you get an injury. 
And this is something really interesting that um, a colleague at the EIS passed on to me, um, some work done at Nottingham University by philosophers. And this is about caus causality per se, it's not about causality of injury. And the, the uh, example they give in this is, you know, if you've got a match and a flame um, and a matchbox and you strike it, you're not necessarily going to get a flame, you're not going to necessarily get an ignition. And, and they talk through um, what you need to have causation, and causation is not necessarily going to happen just because you've got the factors in place which should cause it. So really interesting read, quite hard work. Um, I must admit, I, I wouldn't profess to understand what a leaning heart of it, half of it, but a really nice, um, this is what they used about the match and the flame analogy, but you may be able to use it for injury as well. So injury is probably only likely to occur when you, you breach a threshold for that tissue. Um, and any single factor is unlikely to do that. And actually some factors might protect against it. So for example, sleep, if we go back to the Usain Bolt, uh, example at the World Championships, he was competing late at night, um, perhaps not getting much sleep after that, who knows, so maybe that was a factor in, in his, uh, whether he had previous hamstring injuries, being a, a sprinter, almost certainly would have, whether he had uh, some weakness or was unprepared for the demands of running rounds of 100 metres and, and relays in a major championships. Um, and perhaps those, any one of those things on their own may not be enough to breach that, that threshold, but you might get a combination of some of those which then would result in that vector and lead to suppression the threshold into injury. So again, there's been two or three papers, or actually probably more than that, four or five, there's almost a whole version of BJSM recently on complex systems. I'm a little bit sceptical still, still, when you read these and you look at one of, this one in particular has got a whole huge list of risk factors that might be associated with the injury in recreational running, down to governance, to shoes, to everything. For me it still reads like a bit of a list of risk factors with a flowchart and it's really difficult to work out how you might apply that, especially in an elite sports setting, to work out what combinations and amounts of, of risk factors might then lead to injury. Um, so that's on the prevention side. In terms of return to play, it's, it's just the, the flip side for me, is managing those risk factors. Um, and we talk about exceeding pre-injury strength. So one of the questions in, in Nick's Delphi study was, should they get back to their pre-injury strength? Well, if they got injured, maybe the pre-injury strength wasn't enough. So perhaps we should be looking to exceed that. Um, another tip is you know, running athletes like to be running, running sport athletes who get lower limb injuries like to be running. So get them running early. The safe way to do it might be on stairs. The most risky part is probably running fast over ground, do that last. If they run curves and bends and cut, do that in training and allow adequate time to build up and prepare the tissue for the return to play. And the return to play definition is, is vitally important. So some work, um, uh, someone I've been fortunate enough to be involved with the last few years, Franz Bosch does, in terms of you know, traditional type exercise, a Nordic type exercise, but having a motor learning component to it where you have an outcome for the exercise, and every exercise having an outcome and perhaps that has some benefits in terms of exercise pres prescription, and I'll point you to Francis' work for that. A lot of argument about, for example, with hamstrings, when it occurs, is, is it an eccentric muscle action in the last phase of the swing, or is it more isometric when your foot hits the ground? This is a really recent e EMG study looking at biceps on the top and semi the semi-muscles on the bottom, and showing that the greatest activi activation in the uh, biceps was in the mid-stance phase. Um, and I think there's probably more to go wrong in the mid-stance phase than there is during swing, um, but uh, still no one really knows. So perhaps having more context-specific exercises, the argument whether that's more transferable to function or not, I think there's function and there's, there's exercises and there's never the twain shall meet really. Um, but perhaps this type of exercise where the foot's on the ground, it's closed chain, it's mid-stance, um, the leg is probably in more of a, a posture that's more likely to be in mid-stance of running, and you're challenging both the semis and the biceps by rotating the trunk, but um, maybe that's over complicating things. Stair running, I think it's a great exercise because little load on the hamstrings, little load on the calf, you've got those low grade injuries of those, you can get them stair running comfortably very early within the first seven to 10 days. Athletes like it because they feel like they're doing conditioning um, and they feel like they're running. So they love, much prefer that to be in the pool or on a bike. Um, the ask, askling test you might have seen, validated test for apprehension and return to running, throwing the leg up straight over their head and see if the athlete's painful or, or apprehensive. Uh, a variation that might be this type of uh, activity where you can bridge them up in one leg, bias the biceps, bias the semis by ro rotating. If you can bounce them up and down, they're pretty comfortable with that. Might be a good indicator that they're ready to return to doing some overground running. When they do get to overground running, um, trying to build up the workload, uh, the chronic and acute workload, 
in a sensible way, and that takes some time. You can't do that in a week. It takes two or three weeks to build that up. Lots and lots of good downloads you can get now, those Excel spreadsheets which help you to plan and to monitor that. Um, uh, Sean Williams at, um, at Bath is doing some great work on that. So in summary, uh, the jury is still out on complex systems versus exposure and strength as, as reductionist type um, views of, of injury prevention. Probably, you know, if you want to, to, to be reductionist about it, looking at strength and, and workload as managing those two big risk factors and you might give yourself some more space before you hit the threshold. And now enough time uh, to prepare properly. Probably my take home method, it's probably going to change now based on, uh, on, on Nick's presentation is, if in doubt, give another week. It might be, if in doubt, give another month. Um, but you don't always get that and very rarely do you get that in elite sport. Um, some of the, I haven't really talked about prehab and rehab, um, more about concepts, but you know, these are six, are six people, I think, who are, you know, have opposing views but debate very nicely on Twitter and other forums. And if you're interested in this type of stuff um, and that guy's got some substance behind what they say, although it's still probably opinion-based, then uh, you know, these are some of the, the people that I'd recommend that you have a look at. Thanks very much for listening. speeding up the return to play, which I think is a fairly uh, contentious-based process, but uh, we can, we'll go through some key principles in how we actually look at this, and we'll look at a number of different muscles. So there'll be a lot of overlap with Craig, with Nick, and with the other guys, um, as we've seen before. So um, there's no uh, um, financial disclosures either. So key things for me, just to reiterate what the other um, practitioners have said, is effective differential diagnosis and classification is key. Understanding the first 48 hours can be absolutely vital in terms of the biology of the tissue, the nature and the mechanism of the injury, and how you might manage that differently towards then when you might start to deal with an injury further down the line. Have an athlete profile, but also have a sport profile. So when we start to look at hamstring injuries or other muscle injuries, and we classify them in a heterogeneous way, and we apply that to multiple different athletes and multiple different sports, it becomes a fundamentally flawed process. And so you need to start to have the basics behind the injury mechanism and then apply that to the athlete and the sport that we're looking at. Have some clinical outcomes. Define your end point. So I think that's one of the things that everybody has alluded to, but maybe not said specifically. So as soon as you have an injury, as soon as you've got your diagnosis, your classification, understand what your end point looks like and then work your way backwards towards where you are. It's just good performance planning. Pass the measures as they go and um, capacity-based assessment, as Craig said. We've seen the classification, we've talked about it from a structure point of view, but sometimes we haven't necessarily mentioned the biology. Rob mentioned it very clearly when we're talking in terms of injections, but again, just thinking about can we influence vegetative endothelial growth factor by changing maybe oxygen saturation, and certainly that's something that we've played around with. Can we influence nitric oxygen as well within the injury state? So when we're looking at it, we, talk, we need to understand the continuum of the injury. So the mechanism, the size, the location, and the type. And then is the tendon involved, as, as um, Justin rightly said. So mechanism-wise, so this is for quads. Is it under-striding? Is it a backward lean? Is it excessive hip extension? Back swing? Is it vertical ground reaction force? Are we looking at sprinting versus kicking? Location, proximal, mid-distal, et cetera, as we go through your different grades, your functionality of the, of the area. Um, sorry, going back. So as Craig rightly pointed out, we get a level of causality through all of this, and we've got to look at the complex nature of each variable and how those variables then interact with that individual and that sport. And until we start to gather all that information, you can't make effective, good clinical decision-making, as Rob and Noel spoke about as well. One of the things I would draw your attention to, which everybody else alluded, was the subtle difference between we might have a classification, we might have an injury, we might have a mechanism, but what's a typical injury versus an atypical injury? Certainly in hamstrings, we'll see proximal biceps femoris. We know 80% of all hamstring injuries are biceps femoris, they're proximal, 66% of them occur at speed. There's a lot of debate as to whether it's eccentric in swing phase or whether it's isometric in swing phase, etc. So again, starting to understand that, that, that definition, is it the distal medial hamstrings, which is the next most common injury? So when you start to see distal biceps femoris, 
proximal medial hamstrings that are not an overstretch injury but maybe a sprinting related injury you know that's an atypical injury you know you need to be a little bit more careful so where the guys might say to you well it's a 3c i would then say well it's a 3c that they had up there for 40 to 50 days but if that's an atypical injury then maybe you're then as craig rightly pointed out you're giving them another week you're giving them another month because it will just take longer because you've had an abnormal mechanism when you're understanding that, we need to understand the architecture. And when you go through the calf and you look at the different role of different muscles, so we look at medial and gastroc head, which is very much about stiffness and elasticity and elastic energy transfer at a certain velocity. FHL and FDL will contribute to that. But when we're looking at soleus here, we see the pination angle, the cross-sectional area, and the peak force being significant. But tib, po tib anterior having the biggest influence on range of movement. So that supernatory moment arm and or dorsiflexion, which Noel alluded to within the technical aspects of running, is pretty key. So again, it's understanding the interaction of all these different muscles, how they work synergistically, if you're then going to improve the return to play. Noel put up this slide here from Richard Lieber, and yes, he did publish it in 2011, but he first published it in 98. And... Um, I was recently in Holland and I used the word soleus and they all looked at me and said, well, what on earth are you talking about? And it's just a recognition to Nick here. And they all said, oh, it's called soleus. And for me, this is a mighty Greek god and it is vitally important towards what we need to do for running and running mechanics. And so from now on, I will always refer to it as soleus. <laughs> just a little bit of fun, it's just a recognition to the Dutch, really. So when you look at soleus... It has this big cross-sectional area. When you look at the three-dimensional nature of the muscle, it is, has a significant contour. If we forget about that and we're dealing with a gastroc injury, we're forgetting about it at our peril. Okay? Why, why do we need to recognise that? Well, everyone spoke about this gross external load mechanism, but when we're looking at running, we know gravity is 10 metres a second or just below that. We know that, therefore, it has a huge potential to move you at a significant speed, and therefore, you need to be able to control that speed. But equally, it has a huge amount of load factors. So if you break it down very simply, and Jared alluded to this earlier in running on tendons, you've got two to three times body weight on foot contact. If I'm an 80-kilo male jogging 400 metres, that's 133 foot contacts per side. Therefore, 400 metres is 21,000 kilograms of force per leg. A mile is 85,000 kilograms of force per leg, and I'm going to go off and run 10K, and that is half a, a million kilograms of force per leg. I've got to have some basic requirements in order to deal with that. If I don't, I'm going to break down. All right? When we look at muscle forces in running, again, Noel alluded to this, soleus here. See, I just can't let it go, can I? Um, again, six times body weight. We might talk about flex... Um, sorry tibialis posterior, we might talk about perineus longus or flexor hallucis longus, but we're really talking significantly lower forces than what soleus is doing in terms of that vertical force generation. And so therefore their role is much more around elastic stiffness. So we need to think about how we're going to train them if we're going to speed up that return to play or even just manage it appropriately. Staying on the theme of calves, we deal with multi-directional sports. We've heard a lot about track and field, but track and field athletes skate as they come out of a block, so it's a multi-directional movement, as Rob alluded to within the spinal kinematics that he showed. So when we look at change of direction, we see the forces that get generated. And in a nutshell, large ankle power, plant affection moment, small ground contact time are your key determinants to change of direction. For years, we were taught that it was all about the hip. And I'm a hip man, and I love my hips. I love my groins more, but I love my hips. There's no love in the room, right? Yeah, come on, that's, that's quite a funny joke. Uh, so again, <laughs> it's all about ankle foot, okay? Are we getting the plantar flexion force to change direction? What we did with um, the England seven guys leading up to it, we decided to pro profile them a year out from Rio. And what we found was pretty much all of the sevens guys, so 13 athletes, 26 data sets here, but again, looking at, whatever that would be, uh, 78 data sets across the board. None of them could generate over three times or much more over than three times body weight. We were getting a lot of ankle injuries, syndesmotic injuries, recurrent calf strains. Sat down with Dan Howes, who's presented earlier on Achille, um, ACL injuries, put in a significant strength programme. By the time we got to just after Rio, we only had three athletes or three data sets across two athletes. 
where that was below where we needed it to be, where, again, you're recognising this at five times body weight vertical force on plantar flexion. Now, as Craig mentioned, maybe that pre-morbid strength just wasn't good enough. And getting them back to that level just isn't good enough. We need to get them back to a level that's beyond that. If we talk in terms of hamstrings, as the guys mentioned already, we've got to differentiate between all of them. Again, classifying them as a heterogeneous group is, again, a flawed process. So membranosis is a strength muscle, semitendinosis is an elastic muscle, and biceps femoris is a speed muscle. The architecture tells you it clearly, whether that's Lieber in 2011, whether that's Arnold in 2010, or whether that's Tory in 2006, they all have the same process. What do we do if we do get an injury? Well, there's good evidence out there in terms of early management, and the consensus is pretty clear, but maybe we need to tinker with that. That's good basic guidelines of what we do. So first 48 hours, we know inflammation can be our friend, but we need to control it and modulate it, as Rob rightly said. So we might avoid the use of non-steroidals, but then we might start to use them or use injection therapy after that, after we've allowed for normal tissue healing. Ice and compression is vital. We find compression absolutely key. And then we look at early movement, but avoid stretching and avoid direct soft tissue work within the first period of an injury and excessive travel. Get your continuum of load right. And again, Craig alluded to this between force, tension, speed, and that sport specific load, but always question if the tendon's involved. Why? Your muscle strength curve here is completely different to your tendon strength curve as a stress strain model. So stress, how much force you can take, strain, your percentage of elongation. When we apply a force to a structure, we're applying it to that double unit. And if it's a hamstring, it's tendon to muscle to tendon. So again, you've got to start to think about the dissipation of that load. And that's why you might get some variations within the load models that are out there. We need to think in terms of speed loading, which is pretty critical. And the reason why we have speed loading is for all of these neurological reasons and structural reasons as well. In a nutshell, the, um, the activity or the first phases, short period of immobilization, early resumption of activity and remodeling phase, and then start your loading at an initial protected length tension relationship. We need to add in agility and stability because that's been shown to significantly improve the return to outcut, return to play and not just think about tissue-specific loading, but think about multi-directional loading. In particular, perpendicular loading to a tendon early can really increase that neuromuscular, um, and so that muscle-tendon junction. We know atrophy has a big risk towards re-injury, and so regaining the strength, but then looking at speed and coordination. Be clear what the benefits are between different exercise selections. So we can look at biceps femoris with an RDL having a greater eccentric component, but a glute hammy raise or Nordic having a greater concentric component. Then finally start to think about some global work. So single leg step ups is a gross exercise. It's a kinetic chain rather than specific. But what Vic has showed was there's more stress going through your lower limb on a step up than there is by doing repetitive running. And so therefore in your Likert scale of tissue stress, if I can do repeated step ups, my ability to tolerate conditioning back to running and those loads we've indicated earlier is pretty critical. Craig mentioned this in terms of the hamstrings and the Freckleton research, but we'd point you back to some direction of some other things you can look at. So Stokes did some really nice work on repeated sprint efforts on a bike to increase your growth hormone production. So if the docs are using injection therapy, then why wouldn't we use exercise therapy to stimulate the right hormonal processes as well? And then think about other factors. A little bit over, um, but again, just in summary, diagnosis, classification, and mechanism are absolutely key and provide you the foundation. If we don't get that right, you're on a, a risky and slippery surface to try and accelerate the process. Think about a typical versus atypical. Always understand the biology and not just the structure. Understand the architecture and the function. Understand the demands of the sport you're asking them to go back to and the individual loads of the athlete. Get the loading right set your markers and always define an endpoint at the beginning and at the end and, and check it throughout the whole process. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, we've got 15 minutes for questions, which is a good amount of time. So um, uh, let's try and use it wisely. Um, first question here. Um, Dan Brook, uh, Sports Medicine Registrar in London. 
Um, it was sort of touched on by a couple of people, but just wondering about your thoughts on the role of aspiration in muscular injuries. I, I, yes, I uh, do aspirate in an attempt to restore um, the apposition of the tissue, um, but be aware if you commit to it, you're going to have to do it again. Um, so it will reaccumul reaccumulate in a couple of days. You know, when I first started, there was a school of thought just to leave it. And I think that Noel spoke about that with the tennis leg scenario, just leave it. It's got growth factors in it, et cetera. But actually, you know, I don't think after 10 days that any growth factors there are going to be, you know, contributing any further. So often, as a radiologist, we're asked to drain them, but we'll often say, wait for 10 days, which is interesting because it's sort of anecdotal. When you start really looking at the re research of, you know, you know, what's out there for hematoma drainage, very little. And actually, this idea that they're all solid until 10 days and then they're all liquid is a bit of a load of old rubbish. Um, so I, I personally, I, 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 if somebody was to ask me to do it early, I'd do it. And, uh, and like uh, Noel said, the I warn them the recurrence rate is high, but they often feel a lot better afterwards. And one of the things people said to me is you're going to reduce the risk of um, you know, excessive scarring and, and myositis and cifacans. There's absolutely no evidence for that statement. But... Um, I think the players do feel better afterwards, and I, I think that uh, it's worth doing. I mean, I've got one at the moment. I've just trained twice in the last couple of weeks, but he's played Premier League football games in between. So, you know, he probably wouldn't have been able to if we hadn't taken the blood in the first place. I'll just say the key, the key to early management is to get ice and compression right on the spot and try and limit the bleeding. You don't get into that problem. That's all I'd add. I did hesitate because I, I know about the 10-day rule, but we get the needle in straight away, so. Yeah. 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 Hi, Ali Abbasian, consultant, uh, radiologist. Um, just leading on from that, what about the sharing injuries like moral lavely type lesions? Those can be really troublesome in terms of, you can get yourself into a bit of a pickle if you aspirate and they keep coming back. What, what do you do for those? Uh, the same, and uh, I warn them um, that there's a high risk of recurrence. And um, similarly, what Noel was talking about earlier on, in, in injecting dextrose would not be an unusual thing to do. I tend to just aspirate them first and then get some sort of compression on rather than actually inject an active agent in the first time. No, I don't know whether you do the same, but I tend to do that. Uh, um, and then when it comes round for round 16, then I'll <laughs> ask the plastic surgeons to see them. My record, I think, is 11. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean those, those are, are really difficult, but I've always wondered about Prolo. I don't know, Noel, have you done Prolo for a moral level? I haven't. Uh, yeah, I have. Okay. Yeah. Every one of my patients is cured every time I see them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Any more questions? Just an observation to know about uh, calf injuries. Um, one of the interesting things, we, we had a paper come out in our literature probably about 10 years ago uh, describing tennis leg. And um, what was the most interesting thing about that was 140 patients, 92 point, actually I was going to say 92.6%, but then I just realised that my, one of my favourite phrases is that 92.6% of all <laughs> statistics are made up on the spot. So it can't be 92, but it is in the 90s that they tear at the medial gastrocnemius aponeurosis on the medial side. Uh, but the most interesting thing about that paper was that there was a 14% association with deep vein thrombosis in the calf and that is an unrecognized complication of calf tears mm -hmm. and you know there are occasions where i pick them up and um you know the the docs are not happy because you're given a diagnosis of a deep anthroposes and you know elite athletes are just as susceptible if you shut the, the calf pump down it's going to happen so just to be aware if you do have patients with calf tears there is a, a there is a 14 percent risk that they're going to get a dvt just got this paper on uh, calf tears uh, came out this year in platelets by a chap called Bor Borioni, uh, where they um, randomized the PRP and no PRP, and there was a significant difference uh, in being able to return to exercise, return to walking pain-free, and return to sport by about 50%. So, yeah. so that would be another option. Do you think that was the aspiration or the PRP? Okay. No. You know, that's, the, that's the trouble with, with that particular scenario. I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, obviously we love PRP. Do we? I don't know. 
Uh, we like, I like aspirating it, and uh, the, some of the guys love Chawmil. Chawmil, I meant to ask you, actually, I, have, I did talk about Chawmil recently, and the, the Muller Wolf Heart um, protocol includes spinal injections as well. So he injects, as any of you have been taking players or athletes, patients out to Germany, he injects along the line of the muscle, he injects in the, the muscle injury without guidance, and then uh, he injects up and down the muscle length, and then he injects the spine. Do you do the same? I was just about to ask Rob that question. Yeah, no, I've been out to see uh, Muller, so is James, so is Noel. Um, I think some of what he does uh, seems to make a significant difference. And you know, his, his typical, um, I think if, if you look at his justification, it's also you know, looking at, at his clinical reasoning or whatever reasoning that is. Um, but it's, t it's mainly around muscle dysfunction, muscle tightness and optimizing movement. That's what he's trying to do. And actually, once you understand that, then it kind of makes a bit more sense. So he'll basically inject into where he finds tight muscle and trigger points. He injects into paravertebral areas. Uh, he'll go um, ostinal uh, into the sacroiliac, but it's probably not in the sacroiliac. It's just in that into space where that fascial layer. But that, we, we, we do that in, in, in athletics, and, and it does seem to make a significant difference. If you've got someone you know, with that pelvic rotation, you think there's an SI dysfunction, Yes, you, you can manage it through physiotherapy, osteopathy, osteopathy or whatever, but actually just putting a bit of osteonol in there and you can see a change almost immediate, immediately. And so some of what he, he does might be, sound like a bit of voodoo. You don't necessarily understand it, but I think it can make a significant difference as an adjunct to what the physiotherapists are doing and the, and the coaches are doing. I think the other point with muller Wolfart is everybody says, well, you can't publish in elite sport and there's no good evidence. But if you look at the UEFA Champions League study, uh, then Borussia, you know, his, his team has been in the top two, as in the, the shortest <laughs> duration out of players with muscle injuries for 10 years on the bounce in the UEFA Champions League study. So clearly they're doing something right there. I, I would just say, as, on a cynical side, it does depend on how you fill the forms in. <laughs> Hi, just with regards to PRP, um, I was just wondering what the, the difference of these uh, protocols with regards to the use of PRP in muscle injuries may be with regards to uh, one-off injection, three injections, how far apart, etc. Um, I know Justin's just uh, see one of one of our guys uh, for a one-off injection, and it was really just with regards to with regards to that. Yeah, I mean, in term, the reason why we did one-off injection in him is that you know from my uh, reading of most of the published data on PRP that looks specifically for muscle injuries in footballers, it's a single injection protocol. So um, for me, you know, you, uh, there was, I presented something earlier on, which was a three injection protocol, but related to tendon injuries. So, you know, I, if we're going to try and do at least something based on evidence, you know, that's published, then that, that was why you would do a single injection for a muscle injury. But the, the truth is, in the BJSM, in the last five years, they've had two completely different contrasting, you know, conclusions on the use of uh, PRP in muscle injuries. So I know it's difficult. In my, in my mind, I'd rather do something uh, less traumatic, in other words, a single injection rather than repeated injections, in terms of the rationale behind it. You're stimulating the, 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 the uh, inflammatory pathway and then going through the steps that were mentioned earlier on. You, you don't... The, the protocol is not really, there's not enough data out there to really define what the correct protocol is, I would say. Would you agree with that? In Holland, we have Guus Reuring, who did a big study on PRP in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, saying that placebo is just as, just as effective as, uh, as the PRP injections. Uh, so we are a little bit hesitant to use PRP injections. What are your thoughts on that paper? And because you say we are a fan of PRP, but. Yeah, I know. I mean, I was. I was trying to wind everybody up with that but uh, um, yeah look I mean I have seen that paper and I have I, I was talking about it in one of our radiological conferences in um, in June and the evidence base is extremely mixed and there will be that paper but then there will be other papers that will, will show that there is a significant benefit and then there'll be a meta-analysis that suggests that there's a benefit. But how many papers in that meta-analysis are placebo controlled? I, I can't I can't tell you I can't tell you but look I mean it's not that I'm a because uh, I think a I touched on this earlier on my early lecture, that a lot of this stuff is quite religious. It's a bit like we're hearing about Chormil and Active Vegan it's, and prototherapy and PRP. People are very passionate about it, almost to a religious level. I have to, I love PRP. So, but the truth is, if, you, if you're going to go for evidence, it's not really there. It's not really there. And it's very conflicting, so yeah. 
I'm, a, I'm an atheist. Any other questions from the floor? Uh, an intermuscular tendon injury is different to a free tendon. Your, you, you, you demonstrated some of the properties of a free tendon uh, in the healing process and the ability for it to withstand load and then snap. But an intermuscular tendon is different. So uh, here's a question to, to everybody involved in the rehab of a 3C. Um, we initially seem to stop them doing a bit of stretching earlier on or we, we limit that and we limit also the amount of running that they do and then gradually we build that running back. That rehabilitation process basically means that that injury is going to take a longer time to get better because we're worried about the acute chronic ratio of high speed running and so by designing the program like that to stop it stretching early on and to slow down the progression of running until a later date, are we not creating a situation where we're actually setting ourselves up for a longer return to, uh, to play? I think I go back to the same point I made earlier, that we are basing rehab on heterogeneous sort of hamstring injuries and a, and a structural classification. And we've got to look at some of the functional components that Noel spoke about, et cetera. And until we define that on more complex injuries, we can't start to put timelines or no, non-stretching or non-running or these sort of criteria around what we do. And I think we've got to base those on, start to base those on specific criteria within those individuals, particularly in, in top-end sport, because we see so much recurrence. And we've got to see regardless of the timeline for coming back in the length I think the big issue around the three C's is the recurrence so somewhere we're not getting it right if we're getting that recurrence again and so we need to go back and then relook at well how are we actually classifying that away from just the structural element That's, I agree if you look at our data and our um, return to play times they will be biased because of the decisions that we make um, uh, but if you look across the breadth of literature across different sports and different athletes um, and different design trials, there's a fairly consistent message that the tendon is doing something different and does take longer and has an increased re-injury rate as a general consensus. Um, are, are we, we hope to publish fairly soon a, a, a rehabilitation approach to the, the different classifications within our classification. and. Um, with, within that, uh, protecting the tendon uh, early um, bef before increasing the load in specific tendon loads seems to have brought down our um, return to play times from the previously published work with, with no re-injury rates um, through that, that, that protocol. So, uh, yeah, I, I think there's enough there to say that we should be doing something different. And um, uh, But but we take the point that you know, if we do something different, it may take longer, and therefore that can't just be used in isolation. Yeah. Much as I would love to carry on with this fascinating session, I hope everyone here has seen the value of uh, the five, six very good talks that we've had, and uh, please show your appreciation. Uh,